So um, the part of the business that I work in is called digital marketing, um, as opposed to the, the kind of the sexy Photoshop and Lightroom and the graphics part of, um, of Adobe. Uh, digital marketing, more specific to web analytics. Uh, most of our customers are retail customers. Um, we have about 55,000 physical boxes spread across 20, 30 geographical sites. We're trying to condense that a little bit. Um, and we have a collection of about 20 administrative teams. That's 20 sysadmin, SRE teams, whatever you'd like to call them, uh, spread across the globe, each managing their own products. Uh, we have pretty much any technology you can think of, um, but we're mostly a, a Linux and Unix shop. Um, monitoring tool set, at least network monitoring, is uh, we've got pretty much everything you can think of. We've got some NetFlow collections, full packet capture. We've got IDS. Um, yeah, if you can think of it, we've, we've probably got it running somewhere. Um, so our security monitoring team, uh, so security monitoring in Adobe kind of works two, in uh, two ways. There's the security engineering team, the team that I'm a part of that's responsible for setting up and maintaining running the systems that collect the data. Um, we define what security notables are, which is um, a set of conditions which, if satisfied, creates a, a notable that is uh, action and investigated by a human. And we work with the internal audit team to gauge compliance of these, all of these hosts, systems, platforms um, that are maintained by these 20 administrative teams. Um, as security notables or security events are created, they go over to our security operations team who does the analysis on them. They also hunt through the data, kind of more free form hunting. Um, they investigate possible incidents or anything that's been uh, passed over to us from somewhere else within the organization or third party, um, and they also uh, take part in incident response work. Uh, and so to do this, yeah, so do this, you can, you can use Splunk to uh, manage your environments, and what Splunk is, is it's a uh, data platform. It allows you to collect data, uh, enrich it at collection time, or even enrich it with field extractions at search time. So it deals with structured and unstructured data, and you can, uh, it's very flexible on how you can uh, manipulate the data. And uh, also, uh, which I'll show you in the app, we can do a lot of cross-data correlation. You can actually take config data and overlay it with CloudWatch data and even security data to get a really rich experience because you can um, link all of those different data sources together. Um, Splunk also has a really um, good reporting and alerting system, so you can send executive dashboards and uh, also alert into like ticketing systems for resolution. How we integrate with uh, AWS is we actually collect uh, all the major data sources uh, for AWS and, uh, and then uh, with our app and add-on, and then you can do all of this different uh, data munging with it as well. So the digital marketing is largely a compromise of a handful of acquisitions. Some of it has been grown organically, uh, like new products that have been built out from within, um, but a lot of them have been acquired externally. Um, several of these were already in, in AWS when we purchased them. Others have been re-architected um, over the past couple of years, and the teams have elected to move into AWS. We have a lot of AWS accounts, um, thousands and thousands of instances across over 200 AWS accounts. And we, were, we determined that we didn't have the data available in these environments when we needed to do any kind of security investigation. So we'd get some third-party notification or realize that something looked a little funny, and we'd realized we didn't have the data to dig in and determine if something was going wrong there. We also didn't have the ability to make assertions to our compliance team that everything was hunky-dory and was set up the way it should be. Um, so our management gave us a, a mandate that we needed to fix this. We needed to figure out what visibility we could get for security monitoring in AWS. Um, we needed to collect that data, uh, and we needed to make it as, as inexpensive as we were able to. Um, and we needed to have almost like no possible way of impacting operations. Um, if you want to lose reputation as a security team in your organization, um, impact operations. You're pretty guaranteed like lose funding, lose respect. It's, it makes it life a lot more difficult. So a little bit of context around what a security incident looks like in AWS. There's basically three families. Um, infrastructure impact. This is where a bad actor is using normal access to your application to impact it negatively. That's usually going to be something like a DDoS, um, where they're just exceeding the amount, uh, they're exceeding, they're using your services in such a way that makes it so that your services are incapable of providing um, services to other users. Next is host compromise. So this is your garden variety um, application ex 
application vulnerability being exploited. So you have either some service that was not supposed to be public facing inadvertently get public facing, or you have a vulnerability in your web application that's exploited. A baddie pops a web shell, puts something on your box, installs persistence, and they're able to do something on that host. Um, next is very specific to, uh, to cloud deployments, where you have an account compromise. And this is where the, the baddie is interacting with uh, your cloud provider, with AWS, as an authenticated AWS user. So that means that they've managed to get a hold of um, a user's AWS console uh, username and password, or they got access to an API key somehow, either through a compromised dev machine or somebody accidentally pushed something with your API key to Git, um, that can by far be the most damaging um, of compromises that you can run into in AWS. Obviously, depending on what permissions that account has. So we had um, some initial goals that we put together. Um, when we had the requirements from management, we also had some things that we wanted to do to make lives easier on ourselves. Um, we wanted to identify and collect the data we wanted to do the analysis of that data the same way that we were doing it for our on-premise monitoring. So we wanted to collect the data into Splunk, we wanted to generate notables off of that and have that action by our security operations team. We did not want to split out our monitoring into two different places um, because then we'd have to train our, our analysts on a whole new set of technologies, have them log into some other console, um, we'd have to pipe all of our threat intelligence and like it was just too much of a mess to try and do this collection and monitoring in multiple places. So we wanted to have it in one place. Um, to minimize operations impact, we did not want to create hundreds and hundreds of IAM users across these, these AWS accounts. Um, we didn't want to have any monitoring in line, so no risk to services uh, through potential traffic disruption. And we wanted to make it very, very easy to set up since we, more specifically I, was probably going to have to do this 200 plus times. I didn't want to spend the next three years deploying this. So uh, quick to set up. So to monitor your AWS environment, the AWS offers a bunch of different services. Um, they have CloudTrail, which allows you to monitor uh, API activity and, and uh, gives you user logs. Uh, they have Trusted Advisor, which is a paid service, which allows you to manage or helps you to manage your account and best practices, gives you lots of advice on, on ways to remediate issues that you may have. Um, they have AWS Config, which allows you to see all of the changes that are happening in your account and, and track those, as well as track the inventory within your, your environment. Um, they have a, a, a newer system that's called VPC Flow Logs, which is the equivalent of firewall rules for like Amazon instances, and that allows you to see authorized activity and unauthorized activity that are trying to get through your, your firewall. Um, they also have a, a key management and access system, uh, which is the IAM uh, stuff that uh, Scott was talking about, and they also have uh, ELB logs, which allow you to see all the activity that's coming through your environment. The great thing about this is the way that they log all of this stuff is in JSON format, which is really easy for Splunk to consume and then also um, you know, uh, pivot on, on key values. One quick clarification on the VPC flow logs is that in addition to giving you firewall-like rules where things are accepted or denied, it will also give you um, any interaction between ENIs, between network interfaces within your VPC. So you're not only getting traffic into or out of your perimeter, you're also getting traffic within your network. Um, so the first thing that we discovered as I started doing my research to figure out how to make this easy on myself was IAM roles versus users. Um, IAM, you can create users, which is usually represent an entity. They have, uh, a, they have a name, they have API keys uh, that will need to be rotated. Um, you can also have roles, and the distinction between a user and a role is that a role does not have a credential. Um, rather than authenticating directly to a role, a role permits some other entity, um, it, uh, they're termed principles, like a different user, a different role, potentially an IP address, to assume that role and gain the privileges of that role. So if I am authenticated to a user in a different AWS account, and a role has been set up to allow me to assume that role, I can then uh, re request temporary tokens into the, assume, into the other account and take actions on that account without actually owning and maintaining and rotating API keys. Um, so it, it's a pretty elegant way of um, setting up access without requiring keys. 
No. Oh, these are me. Yeah. OK, so a few more uh, AWS services. I imagine most of the people in this room are probably already familiar with this. Um, but as they come into play with how we do our collection, I'm going to review them very briefly. S3 is file and object storage. You put an object up, like a document, you pull it back down. Um, Lambda, uh, you can run your functions, scripts, whatever you'd like as uh, code without instances. In the back end, they're basically spinning up a temporary container for you, dropping your script in there, executing it, and then tearing it back down. Um, most of the Lambda work that I've done is in Python. So as we talk uh, more about how we're using Lambda here, those are mostly Python functions. Um, Amazon Kinesis is used for scale data streaming. Um, CloudWatch Logs is the uh, AWS service for aggregating logs from your instances and from a few other services. VPC flows are delivered initially to CloudWatch Logs. Um, SNS notification services allows you to send a message to the SNS endpoint, which is then replicated to any uh, any other services that are subscribed to that notification service, to that topic. Um, DynamoDB is a NoSQL database. We largely are using that in this situation for configuration store. So collection plumbing. Um, most of the data sources that we wanted to collect can be delivered um, automatically, basically, to an S3 bucket. Um, most of them, you can set up one, ELD, one S3 bucket and collect it globally um, for Example, config and cloud trail and trusted, well, config and cloud trail can both be set up to deliver um, globally to a single, EL, to a single S3 bucket. Um, ELB, you do have to set up a different S3 bucket in each region that has to be local to the, um, local to the ELB that is delivering those logs or generating those logs. Um, and trusted advisor results and uh, config parsed are another two bucket two buckets that we might use to make a life a little bit easier on ourselves um, when it comes to Splunk ingest. So VPC flows. Um, we, to collect VPC flows, you need a Kinesis stream in the region you're collecting the flows from, and you set up a CloudWatch log destination in that account. So jumping to a more graphical representation of what this looks like, the delivery, um, CloudTrail and config are both set up, can be set up, to deliver to an S3 bucket that is in a different AWS account. Um, as long as the permissions on those S3 buckets are set up to permit AWS to deliver those logs. ELB access logs delivers from the ELB, uh, are generated from the ELB, is delivered by the ELB log service to an S3 bucket in the same region. Um, VPC flow logs are a little bit trickier. Um, on the monitored account, you have to set up what is called a, uh, you set up a CloudWatch logs group, um, and instruct the VPC to deliver those logs to that logs group, and you then set up a subscription filter on the logs group to replicate any events that hit that log group across to the other AWS account's CloudWatch logs destination. Um, this is where your filtering can happen. There's not a a ton of filtering. Uh, there may be some, there's, there's some filtering options. You can basically set it up to, um, send messages for a given set of IPs. You can set it up to send messages for accepts or denies. So if you're only interested in collecting some subset of your VPC flows, um, this is probably where you would put that filter in place. Um, those logs hit the CloudWatch logs destination in my account, in the aggregation account. This is not the account that the, the data is being generated from. It's forwarded into it. Um, and then those are sent into Kinesis. Um, yeah, so VPC flow logs to CloudWatch logs to CloudWatch log destination to Kinesis. The other two don't have a way of automating the, that delivery. Um, for IAM, mostly the credential reports is what we're collecting and the trusted advisor results, which we refresh daily. You can't set those up to say, I want this every day, please send it to me. Um, so we have a Lambda function that assumes the role that we create in the other account requests the report to be generated, retrieves the report, and then manually stores that in a new S3 bucket. So the other uh, CloudTrail, Config, and CloudWatch are automatically delivered on a regular basis. IAM Credential Report and Trusted Advisor requires some kind of trigger to generate, report, uh, generate retrieve, and store those, uh, that data. So that's how the things are delivered. Um, but it still takes a little bit of work to actually set up that delivery. So we've created a CloudFormation template. It's actually a pretty simple CloudFormation template. It does not touch any of EC2. All it does is it takes a, a couple of inputs. Um, when you create a CloudFormation template, you can specify parameters that are handed into the template. 
We use a friendly name uh, so that the people that are setting this up have an idea of what each AWS account is used for. Um, we have a JIRA queue. Most of the work that we do is tracked through JIRA. So when we have something that happens in an AWS account, we have a contact point. We have that JIRA queue to know who to escalate to. And we have a description so that if that JIRA queue manages a handful of different AWS accounts, um, they can have some idea of what the AWS account is used for um, without needing to like, figure out, OK, that ID, log into that, ID, log into that account, what's going on in this account. Oh, it's, it's uh, the stage environment for whatever product I'm doing over here. Um, the description makes it a lot easier to track um, which account is used for what. The resources that it creates are the, a config role and a flow logs role. These two are used by AWS to deliver or to retrieve, generate, and deliver the logs into the account. So as a security team, we do not use the configure flow logs role. Uh, we also create a security engineering role. Um, this role is a, actually has pretty limited permissions. It has um, read to most of the services. It has the ability to um, modify ELB attributes to turn on ELB, uh, ELB access log delivery. Uh, it has the ability to turn on and off VPC flow logs, uh, to do config snapshots, retrieve trusted advisor, a handful of other things. Um, most of the teams that we've worked with in deploying this have felt pretty comfortable with giving us these permissions as they're, it doesn't include anything that could impact, that could significantly impact what they're doing. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So as CloudFormation is finished, we, excuse me, when we're setting up CloudFormation to deploy, we also give it an SNS topic to, to send notifications of stack completion to. So as each one of these resources is, starts to be created, CloudFormation sends a message to me, well, to my SNS topic, saying, I'm starting to create this role, now this role, now this role, oh, I'm all done. When I receive that I'm all done message, I fire off a Lambda function that uses the newly created role, jumps in, use, uses that role to jump into the newly registered account, grabs the outputs and inputs of this CloudFormation deployment, and then puts that into a DynamoDB registration, uh, a registration item. So that makes it so that whenever anybody runs this CloudFormation template, as long as they specify the destination, the notification ARN for the SNS topic, I get an idea of who has deployed my role, what the name of that role is, and uh, the JIRA queue and the description for the account. Um, if you haven't used CloudFormation, it's very, very simple. Um, when you, it, it'll prompt you for a stack name, which for us, we don't care. That's entirely for the account that's being registered to track which, uh, which stack is this. So most of them are naming it something like the information security monitoring stack or something along those lines. Um, they're also prompted at this point for uh, the name, the JIRA queue, and then what types of, what, what environment phase they're in, dev stage or prod. So once we have that role in place, um, we have a handful of Lambda functions that operate on a trigger. Most of these triggers are every day because that's a fine enough granularity for us to enforce them. Some of them are every six hours if we feel like we need uh, less space between the times we're collecting data, if there are things that are a little more dynamic, change more often. Um, most of the functions are also split into two functions. Um, if you use Lambda, um, you may have noticed that there's a maximum execution time of five minutes. Um, if you're trying to do something across 50 or 100 AWS accounts, almost no matter how trivial it is, it could take you about five minutes just to assume the role and get the API key and do something small and simple. So to avoid any timeout problems, we've split this into two functions. One is a distributor function that basically retrieves the list of roles from DynamoDB. Um, and then hands each of those roles off to a handler function. So distributor function collects all the roles, hands to an asynchronous handler function, which actually is the one that does the work. The handler function takes the role, hits the STS service, retrieves those temporary credentials that it's able to through the role, um, reaches out to DynamoDB to determine if there are any exception, exceptions set for this account. Um, for config, this is rare. Um, it's unusual that uh, there, config is a small enough amount of data that collecting it every day from every account isn't painful. Um, and that you're not sending a ton of data into Splunk that you're going to be paying more for hardware or licensing. Um, so config is not a problem. With ELB access logs and VPC flow logs, those volumes can be massive. Um, right now, we're collecting somewhere between two and a half and three terabytes a day of ELB access logs and VPC flow logs. 
some of those, some of, uh, that's after trimming out a bunch of ELBs and VPCs that didn't make sense for us to collect. So there are some situations where you will want to put an exception in um, your configuration management in Dynamo, not configuration management, but in your DynamoDB configuration to say, if it's this ELB or this VPC, just leave it off, don't send that to me, please, I will drown. Um, for config, it's easy, uh, just collect it. It's relatively cheap if you're just doing snapshots. Um, so the handler takes those temporary credentials, jumps into the other account, sets up config, um, enables it, creates a config recorder, sets a config delivery channel, and then specifies the frequency that you want these snapshots delivered. I think we do every four hours. Um, config then, from that point on, will every four hours deliver a snapshot, um, depending on how you have it configured, from either one region or every region to your S3 bucket. We trigger this every day. Um, this Lambda function is set off every day so that if for some reason config is disabled in a region, um, within 24 hours, excuse me, yeah, within 24 hours, it is re-enabled and those config snapshots start coming in again. For scheduled retrieval and storage, like for trusted advisor and IAM credential reports, um, the first part looks a lot the same. Distributor function gets the role, has to a handler function, retrieves temporary credentials, but it will assume those credentials, generate the report, um, pull for a little bit to make sure that the report is finished, then retrieve it, and then store that into S3 rather than waiting for the service to deliver it into S3 itself. So dashboards and analysis. Um, initially, so we use the Splunk add-on for Amazon Web Services, which Randy's gonna speak a little bit more about in a couple minutes. Um, it has inputs for tons of different AWS services, which he'll speak about as well. Um, we only use the S3 input. Um, the reason for that is that we are aggregating all of our logs into S3 buckets before sent, pulling them into Splunk. Um, if you only have a handful of accounts, it's not too bad to set up these inputs for each account as they come online. Um, you'd be setting up one for ELB in each region, one for CloudTrail, one for VPC flow log, or one for VPC flows in each region, and perhaps a handful of others. It comes to about, uh, I think, 14 inputs for, per account. For us, that wasn't gonna scale well. We would be handling thousands and thousands of Splunk input stanzas, um, which wasn't practical for us for just AWS monitoring. Um, by aggregating them all into one AWS account, into those S3 and Kinesis, then you can set up 26 inputs, and regardless of how many AWS accounts you spin up, you never have to add additional, uh, additional inputs. Um, the one caveat to that is if your volume is so high that you need to split what you're ingesting into multiple um, Splunk indexers, then you may need to put those into different S3 buckets, have one, uh, uh, have one indexer pull from one bucket and the other pull from the other batch of buckets. So you can scale horizontally. Um, this is slightly dated information. Um, there used to be two separate apps, one to collect from most AWS services and another app, it was, I believe, a community supported app to pull in the Kinesis, uh, your VPC flow logs from Kinesis. Um, the, the Splunk um, AWS TA team has done a great job and they've integrated the Kinesis input into their TA. Um, so you should be able to be fine just with the one TA. So once you have the data in Splunk, um, you still wanna be able to do your data enrichment. Um, and parsing. So most of the data is in JSON, which Splunk parses just fine. Um, you can basically send any kind of JSON data into Splunk, and as long as it's not nested too far down and using arrays, and there's a couple caveats, weird things you can do with that. But if it's a straight JSON dictionary, it parses very, very easily. Um, we use the HTTP event collector, which is a, uh, it's a web, it's a, basically an API that you can use to send events directly into Splunk. So we collect the DynamoDB registrations and submit that. So we always have an up-to-date idea of what accounts are registered, what do we have monitored, and who do they belong to as a lookup in our, in our Splunk deployment. And we have automatic lookups on each source type. So as we see an event in Splunk, we can hit the expand this event and we can tell who it belongs to, what the JIRA queue is, uh, the account description, all that kind of stuff. Um, the source types also um, tag into the enterprise security data models, which makes some of our um, correlation searches that we've set up for other monitoring tools work right out of the box. 
So about two or three days after I had set up some of our initial accounts, I got a call from our SOC saying that asking what this data was coming from AWS that was triggering on our threat intelligence. I had no idea that that was going to happen. Um, I just set up the ingest, had it use the source type the, provided by the TA, and like it was, it was working pretty much out of the box. It was awesome. It was kind of startling, but it was awesome. Um, this also is slightly dated. We now have 57 AWS accounts that we've onboarded with this. Um, and just show, actually, I think we have closer to like 5,500 uh, instances running right now and pushing now closer to three terabytes a day that we're ingesting. One heavy forwarder is handling it at this point. If you're familiar with Splunk, it's a pretty beefy heavy forwarder, um, but it's, it's doing the job. So we've created a handful of dashboards to give us context when we're doing an investigation or if we're just trying to get an idea of what an account is used for. Um, so this is a Splunk dashboard that's been generated off of the config data. It shows us the name of the account, the account ID, which I've truncated here, um, the JIRA queue that escalations would go to, a few uh, high-level compliance issues for us, whether or not CAM and CLAMP, which are uh, basically authentication, uh, like federated authentication mechanisms for us, what users are in the account, um, if there have been any failed console logins. So once we have config and credential reports and some of the other data, we can then automate a lot of our compliance checks. So if we want to make sure that no instances are in uh, are outside of a VPC, we want to make sure that nobody's using EC2 Classic, we can do that very easily by saying, all right, config data, give me everything that's an EC2 instance that does not have a VPC, a relationship, and um, if an account has, that in, uh, has a non-VPC instance, then trigger this compliance alarm. And we hand, this, uh, we hand this report off to our compliance team every day. So as compliance is trying to determine who they need to work with to fix things, they can use this, this sheet that's dynamically and automatically generated for them to tell, okay, within the last 24 hours, this is what each of these accounts had set up with that was good or bad. Uh, let's see. Yep. So we cr we've basically go through our Adobe AWS minimum bar, which is a set of requirements our compliance team has made, and we we turn each of those like verbal requirements into a Splunk query that can be used to determine whether or not an account is in compliance. Resource lookups is actually a lot more useful than I thought it was going to be. Um, since you're aggregating everything into one place, you can take an IP address. Um, and use the Splunk freeform search to find what, uh, what instance that's associated with, what account it's associated with, who owns it, um, basically any kind of identifier. So if you get an email, your abuse team gets an email from Amazon saying, hey, this IP address or this instance is doing bad stuff, um, you can turn to, turn to your deployment here, put in the IP address or the instance ID, and very quickly get context around what that instance is and what, who owns it. So some example enterprise security correlation rules that we're using. Console logins from outside of your organization's IP space. Uh, this may or may not be of interest to you. Um, maybe you have a lot of people that are working remotely, um, and it's difficult to manage that IP space. Um, for us, we have a pretty good grasp on where people should be doing their administration work from. Um, we require, we uh, recommend that our, all of our devs and our, our operations people VPN through Adobe to access their, their console. Um, so logins from outside the organization's IP space could be indicative of a console password uh, that has gotten out into the wild. Flows to or from threat actors. So this could be host communicating with a command and control ser uh, server instance increase by a certain percentage within 24 hours. This one's been hard. Um, so if, you're, if your console is compromised, then a couple things that some uh, threat actors <clears throat> are going to do is gonna be spin up instances to participate in a, in a denial of service. Or if they're maybe more financially motivated, they may spin up a bunch of instances and start chewing on like Bitcoin miners. Um, but it's, it's usually instance oriented. Um, they're usually af either after data or they're after the instances that they can charge to your credit card. Um, AMI sharing to non-organizational AWS accounts. So um, we did a penetration test, uh, uh, the team that I'm on a while ago, in which we had compromised an AWS account. Um, we got the root credentials to that account, but we weren't able to 
SSH into any of the running instances, but we wanted the data that they had on their custom, like their, uh, their internal AMIs. So we took the AMI, we shared it to another AWS account, and then uh, we shared it to another AWS account and spun it up there so that it would be a little bit more uh, operationally safe. They were less likely to notice that we had shared an AMI to a different account than if we had spun up the AMI in the same account and they noticed the new EC2 instance that, the instance that was running. Um, ELB access logs give you visibility into the user agent and the URI of requests that are made to your application. Um, there are some signatures that you could apply to that. Um, obviously, there's a lot of, of injection opportunities other than through the user agent or the URI. But if you're looking for something like shell shock, that's, that's typically a relatively re reliable way of finding those attempts. Usually those are gonna come through the user agent. Um, another correlation search that we have set up is multiple service API denies for a single API key within a short amount of time. Um, is anyone in the room familiar with Nimbostratus? It's a cloud, it is a cloud. Um, it's also a tool that was released at Black Hat a couple of years ago. It's a permissions enumeration tool. So if you get an API key and you don't know what account it's to and you don't know what permissions it has and it doesn't have permissions to IAM to enumerate its own permissions, um, you can use Nimbostratus to chew through a bunch of common calls and see whether or not it fails on those calls. So if you have a, a user set up that does not have permissions to deploy EC2 instances in a couple of different regions or it's only able to uh, manipulate a couple subnets or something, then when they go through and try and run this permissions enumeration tool, it's gonna throw a lot of failures. Um, usually you'll see that, you can see this sometimes in a dev account where they're trying out some new things, but usually in an operations account where things are well tuned and, and the roles are ideally automatically generated and, permit, and the permissions are automatically generated, you shouldn't be running into a lot of API denies. So in production accounts, multiple service, uh, multiple API denies can be a useful indicator. So a few things that can go wrong when you're setting this up is uh, the Kinesis modular input. This is less relevant now. The, the Kinesis input is available within the Splunk TA. Um, the modular input is a Java, uh, it's a Java executable that can chew up a lot of memory. Um, so you'll probably wanna, manip uh, wanna increase that uh, memory allocation when you're, when you're doing the export, excuse me, when you're setting that up. Um, config snapshots, these things are massive. Um, if you're running a couple hundred instances, you're easily gonna be pushing uh, 500K or a megabyte, which is a lot of text. Um, and is difficult to parse through if you're looking at it in Splunk. Um, so we actually have a, uh, another Lambda function that is triggered off of the put object into S3 that will split that up into individual resources. So rather than having one massive JSON array of resources, we take the account ID, put it into each resource, and then send that into Splunk as its own event. Uh, makes it a lot easier to parse through. Oh, one other hint that I'll put here is VPC flows can get expensive um, because there's a 50, cent, 50 cents per gigabyte um, push into CloudWatch logs. Um, your mileage will definitely vary, but we found that you're likely to pay between one and 3% of your EC2 spend, um, depending on how much on how network communicate, how, how network heavy your, uh, your workloads are. But one to three percent seems to be a good rule of thumb. Um, AWS hints, the ELB permission. So the role has to have the permissions to modify attributes to turn on ELB access logs. Um, you do, however, get a couple, a couple permissions that you probably don't want. Um, I believe those are connection draining and uh, cross zone load balancing. Um, so since there's no, no way to limit those permissions, you kind of just have to have a gentleman's agreement with your product teams that I have these permissions, but pinky promise I won't use them. All I'm gonna do is call modify attributes. Um, you'll wanna keep an eye on your capacity. The things we've run into is DynamoDB read capacity and the Kinesis shard usage. Um, fortunately, those are both relatively easy to, to modify after the resources have been created. Um, as you're looking at CloudTrail, not every action in CloudTrail is a human um, started action. Um, a couple of the things that have caught us when generating, when creating our rules have been auto-scaling actions, which AWS calls for you, and elastic MapReduce. Um, so you may want to create um, suppressions on those two, those two services. So where we're at right now, we have about 57 accounts that are enrolled, pushing three terabytes a day. We haven't broken any accounts yet. 
Um, we've made a couple people a little upset about uh, making them pay a little bit more in some of their CloudWatch log spend, um, but we haven't interrupted operations whatsoever. Um, we found some more data sources. Um, Amazon Inspector and Config Rules are both really interesting data sources that I'd like to start collecting. Um, and starting to work at collecting those, uh, aggregating them across all of our accounts, but not quite there yet. Um, we've been automating our AWS security policy audit. Um, so as auditors or our own compliance internal audit team comes to us and says, hey, you're supposed to be doing this across all accounts, um, if we haven't already created a rule to determine that, within two hours or so, we can create a new rule, assess all of our AWS accounts, and confidently tell audit whether or not we're compliant to that requirement. Uh, written a handful of correlation rules, which I've spoken about, and we have our JIRA, we've automated our JIRA ticketing for remediation. So as um, high-profile compliance issues come up, we have those set up with alerts that will automatically create a JIRA, queue, a JIRA, tibic, JIRA ticket into the appropriate queue, um, which takes a little bit of time off of our, um, off of our compliance team. <clears throat> so uh, that's awesome stuff for, for data collection and, and security. Um, our goal for Splunk is to collect all data from Amazon and help you get actionable, um, uh, and actionable um, insights from that data. And uh, like you said, they, they connected a JIRA um, a ticketing system. We have uh, out-of-box connections for things like ServiceNow and things like that. So you can find an issue and then remediate it. Um, so I just wanted to say Splunk and, and Amazon have a really good relationship. Um, Andy Jassy uh, and Doug Merritt, our CEO, actually had a video where we talked about the integrations between Splunk and Amazon and, uh, and what that means to our customers. Also, we have three personas that we do in the app uh, along with security. We actually go after operational and kind of DevOps uh, experiences, and we're even a customer of the app. We used it to uh, manage our, the, the spend in our accounts. So I'll show you a little bit about that in, in my demo, but uh, you can stop by our booth and, and hear about these customers then, and their success stories as well. So here's an eye chart of all kinds of, uh, of, of things that you can do with the app out of the box. Um, the things that, that Scott was talking about were customizations that were done specifically for the way he uses AWS. We've, we see the app as a really good way to get you started and, and uh, kind of start monitoring your account, but uh, half of the dashboards that we use internally to manage our services are, are customized. And so once you have the data in, you can do all kinds of cool customization. Um, here is a, a scenario where um, your HR director comes to you. Uh, it tells you that you know, Joe's been let go. Um, if you have the data in Splunk, you can notify them if any actions are taken. Here's a really simple alert that you can create that'll actually help you um, alert if anyone actually try, if, if Joe tries to access anything after he's been termed. So it's really easy once the data is there. Um, here's another one where the CFO comes to you and says you need to reduce the amount of spend that you have. Uh, we find that um, a lot of engineers leave their machines running over the weekend because it's easier than starting it back up later. So what we did internally was we saved 40% of the spend in our development accounts by just shutting things down uh, on the weekends, and, uh, and, and it was really successful for us uh, internally. Here's a, a common uh, experience here. Your engineer loves to script everything, so they spin up millions of instances without any tags or anything. You have no idea where anything is or what's going on. Uh, it's really easy to go in with Splunk Search for those uh, untagged uh, EC2 instances, and then even pivot the data to create really nice dashboards. So here's, uh, here's a, a no tag name uh, on, your, on your instances. So you can actually go and, and see this stuff visually. And I also have a demo I'd like to show you of, live demos are always fun. Let's see how this goes. So here is our overview dashboard. Um, one of the awesome things about this AWS app is that you can, uh, after you get all the data into Splunk, you can sort things. Um, you, can, you can see here that um, you have multiple accounts. We only have one demo account in here right now, but if you have a list of accounts, you can see all of those accounts in one place. The other value here is uh, you can put multiple regions here. So all the regions that you actually have data in can be all shown in one place, or you can filter it by region. So you don't have to open up a bunch of tabs like you do in Amazon when you're actually looking at all of that data. 
We also have the ability to pivot things with tags. So uh, using the key value pairs, you can actually uh, put in here, if you tag all your instances for a certain service, you can see what the cost of that service is. So for security data, um, you, can, you can do things like, uh, I see I have 109 um, uh, failures uh, in, in config. So I can actually drill into that, and it takes you into a deeper dashboard so that you can look at what the resource activity, where did all of those errors come from? It actually pre-populates the dashboard with all of your delete, delete um, incidences, shows what um, you can roll over and see when those things happened. You can see who actually, um, you know, what, what uh, instances the actions were taken on. Um, the other cool thing is you can just keep you know, changing these things to see all of the different things that are happening in your account. Um, we have a lot of different security dashboards. You can see there's a bunch here. Um, I think the really interesting ones are things like key pairs. This is a really good example of where you can see when your account has been compromised. Your um, first thing that's going to happen in your account is you're going to see a bunch of key pairs get deleted and a bunch of new ones get created because people are then going to do bit mining and things like that with your instances. So um, this gives you the ability to see at a really high level across a bunch of accounts how that, how that is happening, what actions are happening in your account. Um, also, the activities that, he, that um, Scott was talking about before, where you can actually see the information about uh, what you know, console logins are happening. You can actually track all the user activities in your account. Not necessarily the things that are happening with keys, but things that are actually happening at the console level. So this gives you a really good eye, and because all the data here is time series, you have a, uh, an audit trail of what's happened in your account. If you keep this data for an entire year, uh, you go to term an engineer, you can actually see what they did over the time that they were um, you know, working in your environments. So it gives you a really good uh, audit trail so you can keep track of everything that's happening in your account. Um, one of the things that, that Scott was talking about was VPC flow logs. Um, they're a wealth of information. Uh, yes, they're a large data source, but when you collect this data, you can track authorized and unauthorized actions that are happening in your account. You can drill into things like uh, IP addresses that are connected and see um, possible port sniffing activities or, or uh, all of the denials that have happened between two IP addresses. So you can see if somebody's um, trying to, to crack open your machines. You can see where, where your traffic is coming from. There's a, there's a wealth of information that you can get from, from VPC. Security isn't the only thing we do here. We also um, do operational data. So this is actually, um, this is a topology that's built off of config data. And uh, so this is really rich. Um, you know, Scott was talking about how uh, they break all of their config data apart because it's, it's hard to manage those snapshots and all the events that are happening. We actually um, are, are giving you the ability to, um, one, see all of this in a visual way. So you can see machines that are stopped and started. You can see what happened at that actual uh, point when, when an action was taken. But you can also drill in and see like that specific instance. How much did I pay for that instance last month? How much? Um, how much did I, uh, uh, you know, send through? Uh, C or how much CPU utilization did I have? How many uh, IOPS were? What was I using on the regular basis? And you can actually drill in and see these specific things um, for this instance. It's really good for actually debugging things uh, in your account. Uh, it gives you a good visual way, and the way we uh, rep the way we organized all of the stuff in this. Um, in this dashboard is that the most important things are at the center. So your VPC is the center point, then your subnet, and then your instances. And because all this data is relational, you can actually um, see by clicking on an instance all of this relationship data. So it gives you a tree of how all of your entities are connected together. And uh, this, this is really valuable for, um, for users that are trying to figure out uh, and debug things. Um, we also have a concept of overlays. So you can do things like if you use config rules and inspector for, for compliance, you can actually um, drill into those things and see what, um, what config rules and inspector insights that you've had for that specific instance. This gives you a chance to go in and, and remediate something if you have an issue there. Uh, other things that, a lot of things that people really like with this dashboard is uh, the fact that you can play back everything that's happened. A lot of times people will use this when they spin up a, a new environment and then tear down an old environment and you can uh, get an executive summary of what's happened while um, during that, um, during those config, config changes. And you can see it's, it's showing you the config changes that have happened. And like, like Scott said, you, there's a lot of, um, a lot of different things that happen during those snapshot changes that you can then go back and drill into the CloudTrail data and see who did it, when they did it. Uh, it gives you a wealth of information. 
Also, um, from this dashboard, because you can sort it by multiple accounts, multiple regions, and even sort with tags, you can see things that are uh, maybe services running across accounts. This visibility is hard to get with other uh, Amazon services. We even have this, this concept of insights. So we um, help you manage your account better. So by clicking on uh, in one of these insights, it will tell you that this instance is, um, under, is overutilized. It's, it's utilized more than 90%. So what you should probably do is take this instance and uh, make it a bigger EC2 instance so that you uh, improve the user experience on that instance. And by accepting and denying these um, uh, insights, it will actually hone the algorithm for, um, uh, for the recommendations for you. Um, because all the data in Splunk is time series, we also have the ability to um, correlate a bunch of different data sources. Here's config and inspector um, data, which and then lay it out in a timeline. So for compliance reasons, if you want to know when that instance was started, you want to know who started it, you want to know uh, other updates that were happened to the resources, it allows you to visually see one instance and in the entire life cycle of that instance. So there's a bunch of stuff in the AWS app. Um, I'm going to... Um, not show you any more today because we're running out of time. Um, but if you stop by our booth, um, if you stop by our booth, uh, 206, um, you can get more information in a demo from our team about the AWS app. Also, we're offering the AWS app on Splunk Lite at the marketplace, and that's for six months for free. Um, so uh, you can go try it out in the marketplace and, and um, try it for yourself in your own account. Thank you guys. Um, do you have any questions? And, uh, and thanks for having us.